Today's episode of the Goldcast is sponsored by the wait, the long, long wait from now to the start of the NFL season. <laughs> it's so long, so long. Anyways, we're gonna, of course, we're gonna open up with some 49ers. Then we're gonna get into Warriors because things are starting to heat up. You are starting to see some new things coming out of the Warriors, and I'm really happy to do that. I'm really happy to talk about it. But before we get started, Raymond, why don't you let them know where can they find us? You can like us at facebook.com slash the goldcast. You can also follow us on Twitter at the goldcast underscore. You can also follow us on Instagram at the goldcast. You can also subscribe to us via iTunes, YouTube, and Stitcher, all under the same name, the goldcast. Like, subscribe, comment. We do our best to try to respond to everybody. And we'd love to hear from you. So do the right thing. Do the right thing, Spike Lee. Here we go. Goldcasts, it's time. Let's get busy. First, the intro dropping. Let's do this. San Francisco, are you ready? ready? This is the Goldcast. Boom! Welcome to another edition of the Gold Cast. We are the Voice of the Bay. I'm your host, Rudy Solis III, and with me is my brother, my co-host, Raymond Solis the First, baby. Boom. Boom, 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 boom. Raymond, Marcus Peters, Mr. Cornerback Extraordinaire, is now officially a Los Angeles Ram. Cornerback's one of the most glaring needs for the 49ers this offseason. I want to talk to you. Apparently, we had some interest in him, and I want to talk to you. How do you feel about Marcus Peters' 18 interceptions? How do you feel about him going to the Los Angeles Rams? I've already gotten a, a text from our friend Louie here, Mr. Our, you know, a Los Angeles co-host likes to come on to the Goldcast now and again during football season. He already was like, hey, man, Jimmy Garoppolo threw interceptions to our second string corners. Now we got Marcus Peters. How do you feel about that? So, Ray, I'm going to ask you, how do you feel about it? Well, it's unfortunate because, like you said, he's got 18 picks, and he's got 18 picks in three seasons, while the corner that will likely leave the Rams, Tremaine Johnson, has 18 interceptions over the course of six seasons. So it took him double the amount of time to accumulate the same productivity that Marcus Peters has accumulated in half the span. So you're obviously an elite player. I mean, he's got some attitude issues. You know, he got suspended by Andy Reid. He came back that very next game, had two picks and a forced fumble. This is a guy who can answer the bell at the drop of a dime. So it does suck to understand that he went to a rival such as the Rams. At the same time, the X factor is goes beyond just what Jimmy Garoppolo can do with his throwing abilities, but also what Kyle Shanahan can dial up in order to take a player like that out of the equation. So I'm not too worried, but it is unfortunate. And it is a big, if I, if I was a Rams fan, I'd be pretty excited. You're getting a top five cornerback and those are extraordinarily hard to come by again, the second hardest position to play next to quarterback. So if you get a top tier player in that, at that position, you, you need to feel pretty, you should feel pretty good about your team. Well, let me put it this way, Raymond. I am not a Los Angeles Ram fan, so I am not excited for the Los Angeles Rams. But I will say this. I feel like this further confirms what we've been discussing, and that is the powers that be, which at the beginning of this decade were squarely on two fronts in San Francisco and Seattle. It is now moving down south, and it's now San Francisco and Los Angeles. I feel like, man, if there was any more proof that the the world is tilting down back into California and with the Seattle Seahawks kind of starting to kind of get into the twilight of their little run and the Cardinals I mean the Cardinals had bursts but they never really had a run to begin with would you agree with that I mean they got they had that one year when Carson had, Palmer came had, back from injury and he was a stud that was it yeah they that's all they that had was, so that was it they I, never really I would say ahead. they're kind of almost in a rebuilding phase you know, they're not full blown rebuild like like we are in San Francisco, but they're like in a hybrid rebuilding phase. You lose a quarterback and all you've got is a defense, then you need, you know, you can get away with it with a serviceable serviceable quarterback, but there was a lot of games that they lost, you know, cuz 
They just didn't even have a serviceable quarterback. So if they can get that done, then they can probably be in the mix to hover around 500, maybe even a tick below that. But I don't really expect them to make a run like they did in 2015. Not only did they lose their quarterback, who wasn't all that great to begin with, but they lost their head coach, who was, you know, the puppeteer of that entire, you know, organization or that entire team so now that he's gone i don't really it's it's tough to keep momentum this is the nfl and it's really really difficult to maintain momentum even if you have if you believe in the same philosophy as bruce arians did and you're trying to you know maintain the same continuity so that you know there's a seamless transition from what he established and what the new coach is going to establish i still don't really see them kind of making any sort of hardcore run and in other words i don't i don't think they're going to be legitimate next year regardless there's just too many missing pieces too many no. crucial missing pieces yeah i agree i feel like they're not in a they're not in a they're like in a reboot you know what i mean yeah it's not a complete a rebuild it's like a reboot you know what i mean so it's not they're not starting from scratch you know, a lot of the names you know, a lot of the stories you're familiar with, but they're, it's it's not a full blow up into a rebuild, but it's definitely a reboot. And I still think the time is prime. And, you know, when it comes to Marcus Peters, well, guess what, baby? We got Jimmy Garoppolo, so we ain't scared of you. Let's go. Let's do it. Let's do it. Hey, bring it on. Bring it on. I want the biggest and the best. I'm one of those 49er faithful, one of the gold cast nation where I just want the best to come at us every time. I'm not scared. Go bring it. Bring all your powers. Bring everyone. Bring I want, I want the best Los Angeles version you can bring me. Give me give it to me. That's who I want to play. So I'm not scared. Go for it. Awesome. You know what I mean? The Rams, congratulations. I only beat one playoff team last year. Awesome. Incredible. And they lost first round of the playoffs. Ooh, so scary. Let's go. That's one way to put it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next, right, we are doing the coin flip with the Raiders this coming Friday to determine who gets the ninth or the tenth spot in the in the draft. Does it matter to you? Do, do, do you think it matters either direction, what spot we get, ninth or tenth? Not necessarily, because it, it more it more so matters what the teams in the top five do and who and who might potentially make a jump from, you know, any of the the mid spots you know, the, the mid range spots, because there's a lot of players. There was like several teams that got like each got like Dallas and I forget who else the Dallas and a few other teams got like four compensatory picks and you're allowed to trade those now. So those are like, basically, you know, you can either pick a player or it's a bargaining chip to move around to, to move around the, the board. So I'd be more curious to see what the top five does, who they negotiate with to either stay in position or acquire more picks and move down uh, and thus trading spots with somebody who has that's in a position like Dallas. I mean, I don't expect Dallas. I'm just using them as an example because they're one of several teams that has four compensatory picks. So a team that is in that position, because there was a, those, there was three teams that got four picks and then a bunch of other teams that got like three, two, one, so on and so forth. So any of those teams can make a move depending, you know, how many bargain, how many bargaining chips they're willing to give up. And, you know, if that's enough, you know, fuel to entice one of the top five picks to give up their spot for that. Those are the picks that matter to me because those are the ones I, I got my eye. We need, uh, you know, linebacker, cornerback and offensive lineman are like the three main primary positions that we need right now, you know, and with linebacker, I would argue now with foster having issues, middle linebacker now becomes another a, a need once again whereas before I felt pretty like okay he's pretty good he's kind of beat up last season but as long as he has an off season to recuperate and a full training camp and all that stuff to go through that and get himself into physical condition to you know maintain his style of play and also refine his style of play to become more elite like a Navarro Bowman or a Patrick Willis then I'm fine with him you know middle linebacker is done we should go focus on outside linebacker now with him getting into trouble and potentially becoming another Alden Smith I feel like we should, you know, start to think about or address middle linebacker as a glaring need because there's no guarantee that Foster's going to, you know, stay on, stay on the, uh, stay on the, the good path, you know, cause he seems to be pretty susceptible 
to, you know, falling off the reservation, unfortunately. So, so if, if, if yeah, you're that's the Niners, you, we, you're looking to see what those top positions are going to do because you need three, three, go ahead. I was say you just, you can't trust Reuben Foster. You can't trust him. That's the problem. You know, like I'm with you, you, you just can't trust Reuben Foster now. And that's, that's what really sucks is because he's such a great player. And now, like you said, once again, we now have to fill that spot, you know, from Patrick Wilson, Navarro Bowman, it just keeps going down and down and down. It's so hard when you have talent like Patrick Willis, which is literally a practically Hall of Fame level. Uh, but it's just now, and now we can't trust Ruben Foster. So again, that hole is glaring. Where do you think, let's just, let's just play, you're, you're the assistant to, to John Lynch and you're here and you've got to help make this choice. Let's say you get the number nine spot. I don't see any reason why we wouldn't beat the Raiders. We're better than the Raiders at everything, including coin flipping. So who... Who would who would you get? Who would who would you get at the ninth spot? Would you go O line? Would you address linebacker because you're nervous about Ruben Foster? Where would you go first? I'd say O line. You just spent a ton of money on Jimmy Jimmy Garoppolo, and now he's the highest paid player in NFL history on an annual basis. So the first thing you need to do is protect him because every quarterback, whether they're average, good, or excellent. They all benefit from the same exact theme. It's the same exact thing, and that's time in the pocket. And the only way you're going to accomplish that is with, you know, serviceable linemen. And so I would go interior. If he's available, you know, Quentin Nelson is the guy that everyone seems to be ha- having their eye on. If that kid's available, then I think it's a, it's a no-brainer. Yeah, if he's available, 100%. I I agree. You got to go O-line first. Like I've said, I've been saying on this podcast for a while, if I go up to shake Jimmy's hand over the summer to wish him well this season, I want someone from that offensive line to jump out and slap my hand down. If his grandmother goes to give him a hug in June because she hasn't seen her darling son since he just traded to San Francisco. If she goes to give him a hug, I want a lineman there to block her, chop block her at the knee. That's that's where I basically want Jimmy Garoppolo. I want her to be a bubble boy for the for the next ten years that he plays on this team. I want him to spend the next ten years never touching a human being because every time a single person gets within a breath of him, within a hair's inch of him, I want someone from the O line to be there to stop it. Yeah. Exactly. He he needs 24 hours, seven days a week security, (laughs) round the clock. Sorry, Jimmy. I mean, you're welcome to go to Chicago to get some deep dish pizza. You're welcome to go lay on the beach and hang out with some bunnies. But outside of that, you know, no physical human contact whatsoever for the next, you know, for the next five years. If you think this Tinder date is going to end with a little romp in the bed, think again, buddy. She's not laying a single hand on you. And that, that is the price you pay for being the highest paid quarterback on an annual basis. And you're on the San Francisco 49ers. You will never know. You're like Rogue from the X-Men. You have no idea what human skin feels like. None at all. You don't oh, remember. That's terrible. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what he is. He's, be- he's going to become Rogue. <laughs> he's Rogue. He can only touch, he's he rogue. Can only that's, touch that's the that's football. The whole, only touch the football, and even then only with a glove on. Yeah, so moving on, Raymond. We had a couple good games out of the Warriors this week, uh, I was most intrigued and most excited about, obviously, Warriors at OKC. I wanted to see how they were going to do against OKC. OKC had already won two games. Steve Kerr had ne- never twice. had the Warriors. Yeah, and never had a Kerr-led Warriors team been swept in the season by any other team. No team had gotten had, had gotten a season sweep on them. So OKC comes into Oakland, they come to the Bay, and I was very curious. You know, we've talked a lot about the Warriors looking bored and the Warriors don't want to play defense, and the defense looked pretty spotty against the Clippers, especially at the end there when they kind of just let that whole lead slip away. But I saw a different Warriors team on Saturday, I saw a Warriors team that was playing excellent defense and that really stepped it up. It was a little spotty here and there, but they really clamped down, especially in the second half. Uh, third quarter, 
OKC kind of starts to to get within reach. I mean, really, really close. I think they even got the lead a little bit there towards the end. And then they go on this like 14-2 and two run. It was something crazy like that. And the Warriors just, just kind of blew them out of the water at the end there. And this gave me a little bit more hope. I have to admit, it's it's hard not to see Houston over there with now, as of this evening, we're recording this on a Sunday night, 8.43 p.m. It's hard not to see Houston across the pond there and see their 12-game win streak and not think, oh, man, you know, this is going to be for real. This playoff series is going to be amazing. Uh, but it's hard not to see that and get a little nervous. You know, go, okay, man, damn, you know what I mean? Here's, oof. It's going to be tough. So what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts on the Warriors play against OKC? And what are your thoughts when I tell you that, when I'm saying, hey, look, I'm looking across the pond. I'm seeing the Houston Rockets. I'm seeing 12 straight games. I'm seeing a team that wants to come and take the head of the Warriors off. And they're proving in this regular season how bad they want it. Where do, where do you stand? They're headhunting. They're headhunting for sure. And obviously they're the hottest team in the association you know, numerically speaking, they've won 12 in a row. No one's even, you know, no one's even remotely close to that. So no one's even won half of that. Um, not even the Warriors. However, they've had to win 12 straight just to stay half a game ahead of Golden State, who's six and four in their last 10, whereas Houston is 10 and 0 in their last 10 because they've won 12. So the fact that they have to work so hard just to keep up with Golden State is going to be the deciding factor. Because remember, Golden State keeps up this pace, this level of winning. Not only have they been doing it for the last three seasons, but they do it. Now it's come to a level where it's normal. It's part of their NBA DNA. It's part of how they carry themselves. It's part of their team persona. Whereas Houston is just stepping into this and they are, you know, they are putting they're, they've they are been in fifth gear almost all season long, whereas the Warriors win. They'll like win. They have this same winning record, but they haven't been in fifth gear the whole time. They're like in third gear. You know, sometimes they're they have quarters where it looks like they're in second gear. Some of their losses, they were, you know, obviously in second gear the whole time. You know, notably a couple against OKC where they never they were never able to recover. But at the same time, they do this with a demeanor and and with an energetic demeanor that is not as exhausting it will not will ultimately not turn out to be as exhaustive as Houston Houston's effort will be and what i mean by that is the, the you're going to see this difference this is what i believe anyways it's a theory but i believe that Houston once they get to the playoffs that's where they're going to unravel because it's taking them so much energy just to keep up with the Warriors in the regular season. You know, they're putting forth this effort to keep up with the Warriors in the regular season when truly it's going to count more so in the playoffs naturally. So, I mean, I mean, but going back, but going back to the OKC win, I mean, that was exactly what I wanted to see. I was like, this team beat you twice, decisively twice in a row. And you need to come with, you know, pun intended, you need to come with the thunder and just throw it right back in their face, and that's exactly what they did. And th- that's that's exactly what will happen in the seven-game series. You, you, Thunder will get like one, maybe two games because they've got like three good players. But the Warriors are so deep, and they're they're way they're way more polished. That over a seven-game stretch, it'd be like a six and four, five and one is what I would what I would put them at. Houston probably in the same boat. The other part that we no one's talked about. And I think it's a real thing, and we have plenty of proof of it. We talk about it, for instance, in baseball all the time with Clayton Kershaw. No one really talks about the fact that James Harden has not shown up in the post like three years in a row. He is not very good. He's not good in Game 7s. He's not good at closing out a deal. He lacks confidence in the post, and that's just the truth. He does. He is not a strong player in the postseason, and I'm not really super scared— of a Mike D'Antoni team in the post led by James Harden. Now, we've got Chris Paul in there now. Chris Paul definitely is a closer. That boy's an assassin. I all do respect. But 
I'm still, I still feel like this team is untested. And I still want to see what James Harden can do in the post because James Harden has yet to prove to me that he can hang on the big stage with the big boys. And that's the truth. And I'm sorry, anyone who's watched these, these, these closeout games with Houston the last three years in a row and seen the Rockets just choke it away or James Harden have to be benched in order for the team to even get past, to get past the Clippers, he had to get benched. He had to get benched straight up. So no one ever talks about that side of it. And that part, that part is, you know, I see the 12 and I go, oh man, who these boys are coming. But then I think, wait a minute, this is James Harden. This guy literally has a terrible postseason record. He's not very good in the post. And he's kind of like a Clayton Kershaw. I know it's MLB, but you know, it's another rival of a team of ours that just, they don't seem, they look amazing in the regular season. They look solid on the regular season. Then the post comes around and it's a different story. Yeah, I mean he's great during the regular season, kind of kind of like uh, Peyton Manning. Only Peyton Manning at least has ended his season or career with two rings. Harden has yet to even get to the, you know the, the semifinals. So let alone the finals. But you know he'll have to prove himself again. He's he's good enough to get to the second round, but that's about it. So uh, let's t- let's see if this this third this third run will yield any kind of results. I mean, I think it'd be great to see them clash with the Warriors, but, you know, they can get derailed by San Antonio very easily, you know, uh, so I could see that happening. So it all depends. It all depends. But I don't. I wouldn't trust Harden in the playoffs either, not from what I've seen thus far. Uh, speaking of San Antonio, they beat the Cavs today. So now Cavs, Cavs have lost two of the last three games since post-All-Star break. Do you think, you know, after that big kind of stellar start with that new team, do you think we see the Cavs come down to earth a little bit more? You know, uh, apparently Le- LeBron James this year uh, leads the league, points in the paint, but al- almost no free throws, not many fouls going on there which I think is going to be very detrimental later on. Of course, you know, we've seen, we have seen LeBron James gas out. We have seen him gas out before. And I know middle of the season, he was kind of like, kind of starting to take his foot off the pedal, especially when the Cavs started losing a lot. Now he seems re motivated. You think, what do you think about those Cavs right now? Two out of three. Spurs, Spurs really, I was an impressive game because Spurs pretty much just being led by LaMarcus Aldridge and Marcus Hall, uh, Paul Gasol. And they, they, they were neck and neck, and then the Cavs in the second quarter really started to kind of kind of work their way out. Third quarter, Spurs came back in, locked it down. Fourth quarter, boom, game over, done. What do you th- what do you think about the new look Cavs? Are we going to see a little bit more of that up and down, or you think ah this is a blip? They're probably going to go on another big run. It's up and down because they haven't they haven't established established themselves as a defensive basketball team. They didn't do it last year when they went to the finals, and they're not doing it this year on their way to try to get back to the finals. And the reason why they lost decisively to the Spurs is because the Spurs' persona, you know, is inherently built around defensive play in addition to solid offense. Although they're they're better defensively than they're they're not an offensive juggernaut like Cleveland or Houston or Golden State, but at the same time they can turn on when it really counts and they can lock you down just as good as the Warriors can. So, and they've been doing it for a lot longer, despite the fact that their you know their big three is all but finished, with the exception of Manu Ginobili who still plays and Tony Parker who's a shell of himself. You know they can still turn it on when they when they need to, and they've got players that have bought into the system, and you know led like you said, led by Aldridge. Even though I don't think he's all he's he's fully really kind of embraced the the role that Popovich would like to see him embrace. You know he's still he's still a good player, and it, this is this is what I would expect. This is what I expected to see from Cleveland. I didn't expect them to come out six and ten. After making their big trade, I expected them to fall hard after that because it was just, I thought you gave up six players, you got four back, you know, you're not as deep as you were before and you're going to expect to somehow turn it around in time for the postseason, you know, to make, to make a deep run. I don't think so. I still don't think they're going to make a deep run. I think they get to second round maybe, you know, just because LeBron is good enough to turn himself on and take over a game enough. You know, we saw him do that in 24 or what is it? Yeah. 2016. 
or 2015 when the Warriors won their first championship. So, and he, you know, he didn't have a shell, he had a shell of a team back then. So he's capable of doing that. I just don't know without Kyrie. Now it's just him in love. Basically. I just don't see that happening with the young, I think young bucks are hungry, but they have no playoff experience. So that's going to be uncharted territory for them. And I'm not sure if LeBron James and Kevin Love are, I know Kevin Love's not enough, but I don't know if LeBron James is going to be enough to carry the remainder of that squad. We'll see. Well, I mean, you know, I know you said they were going to fall hard, but, um, you know, six and four, that's only one game over 500. It's not like that's super stellar. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Well, two games over 500, but it's the same record as the Warriors. You know, Warriors are six and four their last 10 games. The only difference is the Warriors won to improve to six and four, whereas Cleveland lost to drop to six and four. So that's obviously a big difference for obvious reasons. But I, uh, I, this is exactly what I expect from these guys. You know, yeah, they beat the Thunder, which, you, which was surprising. But then again, Thunder doesn't play. Thunder plays well against the Warriors. They don't play well against everybody else. They beat the Celtics, which I think is more of a psychological thing that Boston needs to get over. And, you know, they beat, uh, you know, they, they, sh- they need to. They still need to prove themselves against the best of the best. And OKC is not the best of the best. They're a good team. They're not a great team. Boston is a great is a, is a good team, not necessarily a great team. Not yet. You know, they still have to get to the finals to become great. They have the potential to be great behind Brad Stevens. And they true. lost to the it's Rockets. One hundred percent true. Or I'm sorry, the Rockets and mm-hmm. the Pistons. Mm-hmm. One hundred percent true. 100%. Ooh, I can't wait. It's getting juicier by the moment. Oh, I cannot wait. I cannot wait for the NBA playoffs to just begin. Let's just get this over with. We're so close. Only like, what, 22 games left, I believe, for the Warriors? 22, I think is how many left, right? Yeah. So, Raymond, and until that time, we will be here, Goldcast Nation. Hey, guys, what are your thoughts? Let us know. Do you think... Do you think the uh, the Warriors' defensive woes, they're finally going to turn around? We're going to see them play defense, close out the rest of this year. Also, who do you want to see the 49ers get in the draft? Let us know in the comments, man, especially on the YouTube comments. Those are always super fire. Let us know in the comments. And Raymond, before we leave, why don't you let them know where can they find you? You can find me on Facebook.com. I mean, actually, you can find me on Twitter.com. At Ray Solis, you can also <laughs> find me on Instagram at Ray Solis One. Don't don't follow me on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> you can find me on Instagram at Rudy Solis Three. You can find me on Twitter at Rudy Solis Three R D. Rudy Solis Third. So concludes another edition of the Goldcast. We are the voice of the Bay. I'm your host, Rudy Solis Third, and with me is my brother, my co-host. Raymond Solis, the first baby. Boom. We'll see you next time. Same gold cast time. Same gold cast channel. This is, this is the gold cast.